Hello, hello everyone and welcome to, I think this is the fourth in this uh, webinar series. We used to call it the Open Science webinar series, now we're calling it the Open Scholarship uh, webinar series, uh, which is much better for everyone and particularly um, um, today. So we have a great lineup of speakers. Um, what we'd like you to do is to hold on to your questions until the end. Um, and um, uh, you can put them in the chat panel, but if you, you can certainly put them as you think of them, but you may have different ones by the end. And we'll try and, and uh, collect as many as possible. Also, just to note that um, we will aim to finish um, in, on the, uh, <clears throat> in an hour. However, sometimes there are so many questions that um, <clears throat> we, we, um, if you want to stay on, um, the speakers are willing to carry on for another 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, and I want to especially thank Copyright Clearance Festers Centre for hosting these. And here are our speakers, which are absolutely fantastic. We've got Martin Eve, Professor of Literature from Burbeck, and founder and one of the founders of the Open Library of Humanities. We've got John Wilinski, who's Professor of Education at Stanford and uh, Professor of Publishing Study at, at Simon Fraser, uh, who's very well known for um, as Director of the Public Knowledge Project, which many of you know about and um, may be using their open source uh, um, journal systems. And we have Oya Riga, who is the Archive Program Director at Cornell and has been since 2010. Also, um, we have Claire uh, Redhead, who is the Executive Director of OASPA, and she's helping me to co-chair. And I am Katrina McCallum, and I'm the uh, Director of Open Science at Hindawi. So I'm going to hand over straight over to you, Martin. Um. Thank you very much. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, it's always the embarrassing thing when you're talking about publishing and technology for a webinar to go wrong in any way, but hopefully we'll have no technical hitches today. So I've been briefed to kick this off with a background to what consortial funding models for open access actually are. Um, I think my other two co-presenters will talk in more detail about specific uh, projects that they direct between John's efforts in anthropology and um, Oya's extensive background working on archive and its model. Um, I basically want to start by thinking about the ways that we fund publication um, in um, academic disciplines and to question what is happening when we move from a subscription-based model to an open access model that is based on article processing charges. Because despite um, extensive talk in policy documents about a range of models and supporting different types of uh, ways of subsidizing publisher labor, uh, we actually have too strong a focus on article processing charges as the only way to do that. And that comes with several negative consequences that I think have not been properly thought through. And the way that I usually do this is to think about um, uh, kind of analogous situation where you imagine that you have 100 people who've come together in a room who have come to attend a talk. And although I'm making this into something about giving a talk, I'm really talking about how we fund scholarly publication here. So imagine that your 100 people each have $10. That's their budget. It's a very um, equitable distribution here that doesn't really mirror what actually happened in the real world, but it makes it easier to explain this. The speaker speaks for free because they're a typical academic. Um, I'm not being paid to be here today. Uh, I'm doing it out of the goodness of my heart and because I believe in it, but that is a fairly common situation. Let's say the venue needs $50 to cover its costs, and there are 40 such talks per year. So this is a fictional setup. Um, under a traditional model of subscriptions, it looks a little bit like this. Each person pays 50 cents to hear the talk, and if you don't pay, you're not coming in. This is what we call a classic economic model, where essentially people are not willing to pay for something to which others could get access without paying. Each person in this setup can afford to see half the talks per year. Um, but the general public, those outside of the academy, those outside that $10 pool, um, are unlikely to spend their $10 to come and attend, and so won't be able to access uh, the content of that talk. This is one way that you can do it, and it works relatively well in a publishing environment when you have print copies with material costs per item, as opposed to all the costs being front-loaded into the cost of the first copy, as they are in a digital environment. Now, obviously, when we start to think about how you fund open access, and we do need to fund open access, it's not an activity that is devoid of cost. Publishers typeset, copy edit, proofread, 
Uh, they conduct digital preservation, they run businesses, they have many, many overheads that do require remuneration. The obvious way to, do, to reverse this process, if you wanted to do open access, was to say, well, why don't we ask the speaker, the author, to pay the full fee? This is actually a service to the author who wants their work disseminated uh, widely and they want people to be able to attend their talk or read their paper. The problem is that $50 that's being demanded in my metaphorical setup um, is more than the speaker has because the speaker is just one of these academics and only had $10 him or herself. If I had $50 and could, pend it and could spend it, it would be great because everyone could then attend my talk. But what we essentially have here is a problem of distribution. Another way of thinking about this is that if I asked everyone in this uh, webinar to pay 50 cents each, you might say yes. But if I asked a single one of you to pay $50, you might balk at it. Essentially, this article processing charge model concentrates costs on specific parts of the system, um, and the money is not necessarily available at those places. So a good example of this is the fact that uh, research intensive institutions will end up spending a lot more than they spent on subscriptions as a result of a move to article processing charges because they are the ones producing the output. Now you could argue that they are well-funded institutions. They are the ones who are getting project grants that would enable them to budget for APCs. But this only works yeah, firstly in some disciplines and secondly at some types of institution. So the humanities disciplines, for instance, are often poorly funded on a project basis and have ongoing systemic funding that allows them to do their work. It's very hard to budget an article processing charge into that type of institutional support. The second problem is that this stifles institutional mobility. There are a number of institutions that aspire to research intensivity, but who cannot reach that threshold of having um, article processing charge funds at the right place at the right time to spend. So if you're essentially saying that, yes, we want institutional hierarchies to remain fixed uh, for all time, and that wealthy institutions will be able to afford APCs and smaller um, currently teaching focused institutions will not, then you'll never see a shift in where research is conducted. Um, and this is problematic in many ways for open access. There's a third way you can think about this though, um, that's been explored in a number of projects from archive through to Knowledge Unlatched through to my own initiative that I'll talk about shortly and many others in fact. Um, there's a kind of consortial logic that merges the subscription ecosystem with a way of doing things in an open access world. The challenge of it is that it's quite hard to get your head around if you're used to thinking that people only pay money for things from which they directly benefit and that there could be no common pooling of resources to achieve open access. The logic looks a bit like this. Let's say that in my situation of these talks per year, five people attend and pay their full amount to attend each talk. But they let all the other participants attend entirely for free and they let anyone else in the world who wants to attend come in too. Now this still means that we can only fund 50% of the talks if those prices remain the same. I'm not saying that this gets us extra money as a result of, of the situation, but it does change who can come into that room. We could dispute that uh, the venue's charge of $50 is too high and that introducing some market pressure might make it possible to fund more talks. But essentially what we're talking about here is um, keeping the money flows the same, but achieving open access at the same time. Now, there are some problems with this type of logic um, that are mostly theoretical, though, rather than practical in their implementation. The number one thing that people say when you propose this is, well, what about free riders? If I pay to go to a talk or to make an article open access and uh, I let anyone read it for free, I let anyone attend for free, why would anyone else pay? Now that makes sense as a theoretical argument, but we've seen a number of projects now implement this. And fundamentally, people who are paying are the people who've been arguing that there are problems with APCs and that they want open access. And they've been arguing this for almost two decades now. So in fact, they don't mind, is what we've found in our experience. Uh, the other problem with this type of model uh, that's posited to me is that, um, We, how will you scale this beyond a certain point? Is there the point where 
essentially you've got a number of people supporting it and everyone else thinks then they can free ride because they uh, reached the end of the line and you know we don't need to do this or we will cut you from our budget the second that uh, we need to make any cuts at all. I think actually though we've reached a tipping point in the international policy environment uh, with declarations like Plan S stipulating that alternative business models are needed for experimentation and should be supported but now people are looking to disinvest in subscriptions and to find ways of equitably supporting open access. This is actually quite a helpful time for this type of model to arise. And I think it's a helpful model for those who want to flip from a subscription system to an open access system with minimal risk. And I hope that John's going to talk quite a lot more about the possibilities in that exciting space shortly. But just to rephrase this and now to move to a little bit of description of what we've done and what we've achieved so far. Um, so this is what the subscription system looks like at the moment. Just to remind you, you have thousands of libraries all paying relatively large sums into a classical economic system that excludes people from reading. And the irony of this mechanism is that it's library money that goes into building that stop sign. Um, building authentication systems to keep people out costs money and it costs tech um, time to build those. And ironically, the very people who usually want to support open access, the libraries, end up funding the exclusionary system. And I would also say these are supposed to be libraries, not restrooms or toilets or anything like that throughout. Um, I just need some images of people. The consortium model inverts this. It says, OK, we're going to get many libraries to pay relatively small to medium sized sums so that we can make the material available to everyone. You're not paying so your own authors can publish. You're not paying so you have exclusive access. You're paying so that the work can be done of publication so it's available to everyone. To read. Now there are ways that you can give um, certain exclusive benefits to people within consortial models. So what we do is give a governance stake to libraries who join. So essentially one of the problems of the last um, decade and a half is that um, hyperinflationary price increases in library budgets have been completely out of the hands of librarians. They've been unable to effectively neg negotiate these costs and we've seen that um, graph provided by the ARL that shows the 300% above inflation rise in the cost of subscribing to all serials. Whenever a new journal joins our platform, libraries have a vote on whether they want to fund it to join. And if they don't vote in favour of it, we won't raise our prices. This means that libraries get a stake in ensuring that it's a sustainable um, rate rise each year. But it also makes them feel that they had some say in which kind of titles are coming in, what the balance of our disciplinary background looks like, and so forth. And so I just want to close in my last sort of minute with um, what, what we've built so far. And just to remark also upon the labour involved in doing this. So I run the Open Library of Humanities, which publishes 27 journals across the humanities disciplines. We never charge an article processing charge to our authors. Um, because we have institutional membership. And those range from you know, very big institutions, the University of Cambridge, Harvard, UCL, and so on, right down to small theological colleges with a banded structure of payment. That means that we really can get participation from institutions of all shapes and sizes. Um, the fees range from $600 up to $2,500. So we're not talking huge amounts of money, even for the largest here. And we have about 250 um, universities who support us at present. This allows us to fund our operation on a year-to-year -year basis. I also want to point out that we work with linguistics in open access to flip journals from a subscription mechanism to an open access system. And the most prominent of those was the move of the editorial board from Lingua to Glossa, um, a new title they started with us, um, which has gone really well. We've seen over 150 publications from them this year. and several hundred within the um, submission queue at present. That's what we do. Um, I'm just going to close with some figures and some remarks on how you implement this model, but I imagine that other participants will be able to comment on this. Um, we published in our first year 900 plus articles, which comes to a cost per institution per article of around $1.10. So when you start to break this down into those types of figures, you really see uh, a much better distribution of cost among institutions than you get with article processing charges. 
we're keen for others to adopt this model and to advise them on what it looked like for us to implement it. So learned societies who might be looking for routes, obviously John's about to propose something, um, and I hope you read his document before you came, but we would also be happy to speak with any learned society that wanted to think about adapting its model to this. But I do want to say it is hard work. It involves going out and speaking to libraries one-on-one. -on -one. It is a daily grind to change your model, and you need to explain it clearly to people. Um, I hope I've done a good job of that today, but that's not. It's something that requires repeating. Um, but there is increasing uptake. Um, the recent subscribe to open initiative from annual reviews is a good example of that. Um, and I think this is really showing that this model has traction and is taking off. So thank you very much. I hope that was a, a worthwhile introduction and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the other participants. Very many thanks, Martin. That was great. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to John to um, discuss his proposal. Okay, well, thank you, Martin, uh, and I do appreciate the setup and tips of the hat uh, towards uh, what I'm going to present. Um, I just want to give a little bit of context. Uh, I'm situated between Oya and Martin, two very experienced people in the area of consortial funding, um, and I'm going to dare to propose an untried idea um, that builds uh, on uh, what's been done in the past, but that tries to take it to another level. Um, I'm very interested in uh, models that start to speak to universal open access, not open access for the biomedical field with APCs, not open access for the humanities alone. Uh, Martin's model has been at the forefront of in some of the social sciences, um, but ways of thinking about how it is that we can um, move in a way that is across the board, that we have a common cause um, in terms of scholarly publishing. Um, but the instance I'm going to work with is anthropology because I've had the take up and because we have a group that's very interested. So the social sciences are kind of in the middle between the humanities and the sciences in some ways. Um, and in particular, anthropology uh, is in the middle of the social sciences. And I've been working with a group called Librarium uh, for about four years um, on a cooperative consortial kind of model. And we've taken it to a new level um, and are about to launch a pilot uh, project with a number of journals that are in library, like Cultural Anthropology um, and Berghahn Books. Berghahn is a publisher, a small publisher, but has a good number of uh, anthropology journals and social science journals generally. Um, and we're looking at a model that builds in particular um, on the achievements of, of Martin and Oya in terms of library support um, and scope three, which I'll talk about. I'll, let me come back to that. Um, but also tapping into the role of the funders. Uh, and I really want to focus on this. This is the innovative aspect, is bringing the funders fully in. Um, so let me start with the library side. That's the easy one. Um, we do think the library should be supporting, and the libraries are at the forefront of supporting open access. Um, Martin's group, Oya's group, uh, Scope 3, in fact, Scope 3 is really the poster child of library support with 3,000 libraries supporting the particle physics journals to be open access um, and with very little loss of library participation. The free rider question is addressed by a group of 3,000 libraries sticking for round two. This, we're going into another round of three years. Um, so it makes it a very strong case of that support, but I have a few other aspects to add to that. The funder side of things uh, builds on the Gates Foundation's Cronus program. So the Gates Foundation has taken an approach of paying publishers directly. That is, an author who has Gates money submits their article through Cronus. Cronus has an arrangement with 26,000 journals, um, and if they submit their article through Cronus to the journal, the fee is paid by the Gates Foundation directly. Um, and the advantage of that uh, is, seems to be very attractive. Um, it has the funders who have become the strongest advocates. Martin referred to the tipping point uh, with Plan S, and I think we're seeing strong, strong pressure from the publishers to, um, sorry, from the funders, excuse me, from the funders, uh, too many stakeholders here, but from the funders, in pushing uh, for open access, but pushing others to do the work. And I think the funders right now are in an odd situation of being very unevenly involved. Funders are paying APCs through authors. Inefficient system, authors aren't all that accountable in that regard. Um, they handle their money, but the um, funders aren't totally sure how that's being used. 
Funders contribute to indirect costs for institutions, but again, very unevenly from 57% indirect costs for NSF in the case of Stanford and NIH um, to 8% or 10% for uh, private foundations or private philanthropies. So the funders have been in the game, but in a very uneven way. And so what I'm proposing is a model of library plus funder. And that is, uh, We've been looking at the research, we've been looking at people's publications and the journal titles. We've been discovering, let's take anthropology, that about 25% of the articles um, in the anthropology journals we've been looking at, about 20 journals, um, have a funder behind it. These are all subscription journals. Actually, no, some of them are open access, but the majority are subscription journals. Uh, and the publish the funders, excuse me, the funders are contributing indirectly through this indirect cost. It goes to the university, some of it is taken and given to the library, the library pays the subscription, a lot of transaction costs and a lot of loss of accountability. We're suggesting that the funders following the Gates model be billed, invoiced directly. Um, and they be invoiced directly on the basis of the articles that they've actually sponsored in the journal. So we're proposing, and again, the details are still to be worked out, um, but we're proposing that a running average of the last three years should be sufficient for determining what obligation, what responsibilities the funder has, not for research in general, but for the research that they sponsored. Um, and this can involve 50 funders in some of the journals we're looking at, and maybe we start with the top 20% to begin with, who are funding uh, a portion of 30 to 40% of the, of the articles in the, uh, sorry, 30 to 40% of the funded articles. Um, so there is a math to this, there's a rationale, there isn't an aspect of charity. In that sense, from the funders, it is a direct support for what they have a deep interest in, which is sharing the work and making sure the work that they have sponsored as funders um, is publicly available. So if the funders are responsible for 25% of the work generally in anthropology, uh, let me point out that's 85% in the biomedical field, and it's probably um, much, much less in the area of 10%. We haven't done the work on anthrop uh, sorry, in the humanities yet, but we're looking forward to doing that. So it's across the board, but there isn't a field that, doesn't, that, that we can say has zero funders, um, but we understand there's a great variance in it. The other side of it then is the libraries. The libraries would pick up um, what's left. In the field of anthropology, the general average is around 75%. So the libraries would be paying 75% essentially of what they paid for subscriptions with the funder support. Um, this wouldn't be just a random number. This would be based on the actual funding support for the journal. Um, but again, we have the technologies in place. Crossref is collecting funder data. Web of Science has funder data. This, this data is available and it's quite easy to calculate. There needs to be a little bit of standardization we're finding. There, um, everybody has a different name for the funder they're using. And uh, so we need to get that organized a little bit, but we've been doing some of that deduplication and, and um, finding that in fact, um, there are a consistent body of funders who are in the field like anthropology. Winter Grin is a very good example. Um, the Canadian uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council is another one. So the model then brings together these two bodies. In terms of the libraries, we're not asking libraries in general. We think that the idea should be to start with the libraries that are already subscribing to the journal. This model is very focused on journals that are currently in a subscription state and want to flip to open access. The journal, the, the model is also based on the whole range of publishers. Again, the universal notion. This should work just as well. In fact, we're having a meeting this month um, with the publishers, Taylor and Francis is coming, Sage, um, as, as Springer, Nature, um, will all be there. Uh, and we're going to, along with the scholarly societies in anthropology and along with the funders like Wintergrand, NIH, NSF, uh, SHRC in the case of Canada, um, the European Research Council, the funders are coming, the publishers are coming, because the model starts from a notion, and again, there are great inequities, you might want to say, or great differences, let's put it that way, a more neutral term, for the funding um, uh, and the amount of money involved in the journals. But my position has been, after working on this for 20 years, that we need to have an element of good faith, that the prices we're now paying have been arrived at through a difficult process uh, with much negotiation, but it is at least a starting point. Um, and 
and that starting point, in, in my books at least, is, is um, a way to begin. And that is that there are target revenues for each journal at this point. Based on subscriptions, there are other sources of revenue for sure, but I'm focused on the subscription revenue because the subscription revenue is what is preventing the journals from becoming open access. You take that target revenue, you decide how much, uh, and you negotiate it with the libraries and with the funders, and you come up with a fair price, but the publishers need to recover their costs, as Martin pointed out. You then see what proportion belongs to the funders, that their responsibility, um, and you can do that by individual funder in terms of the articles that they have published, uh, that they have sponsored in the past. Then you turn to the libraries and you say that, in fact, in the case of anthropology, this average of 25%, the 75% falls to the libraries that are currently subscribing to the journal. And the libraries then have a choice, and this is the annual reviews model as well. The libraries can say, no, we do not want to uh, participate in this model. We'd rather pay 100% of the subscription fee and not 75% and keep the journals locked up. Now, my feeling is that the libraries have been such advocates for open access, sometimes indifferent, but a lot of them have been very strong advocates. Um, and the idea of being having the funders at the table, the idea of starting to contain their costs, the idea that there is a more equitable distribution of responsibilities, I think will be very attractive, and the idea of a 25% discount um, would be very attractive. Now, it may not begin with 25%. We may not have all of the funders participating in the first instance, um, but this is an ongoing process. So our hopes on April 24th at MIT, um, we think this is a historic first time that four societies in anthropology have come together from Europe, the UK, the US, and Canada. Um, there is an urgency, a sense that something needs to be done. Um, and we're very hopeful that this idea of bringing the funders uh, and the uh, subscribing libraries uh, to the table is an important aspect. Now, just a couple of fine points, if I have a few more minutes, um, uh, Katrina, I, I would say that uh, there's room for growth. We, uh, in each of these cases, I've learned uh, uh, over the years that each of the stakeholders has a certain concern, a certain set of concerns. Uh, from the publisher's perspective, there is the target revenue, but then there are the opportunities for growing. Um, how does this begin to, to uh, move from a, a static system to something that can be expanded? And there's incentives uh, to improve the quality of service for journals. Um, and what we're proposing is that, in fact, something very similar to the current situation is there, that they can begin to convince libraries that are not subscribing, that haven't subscribed in the past, that they are major users or substantial users of the journal. It's easy now. We have, we're able to gather usage data on, data on open access journals. We can track the IP range from the library and see that the uh, library is using the journal. Even though it's open access, we can see that it's using the journal for its authors. Even the rejected authors are getting value from the journal. Um, so the potential of expanding the number of libraries that are participating is a very strong aspect. Uh, and similarly with the funders. It's in everyone's interest for the libraries and the funders to ensure that all of the funders are participating um, in this process. Now we've learned that some of these funders are university departments and some of these funders are very small organizations. Um, but on the other hand, they have a commitment to seeing the work published. They have sponsored the research. And we're not talking about a doubling of grants, we're talking in the area of five, 10, 15% of a grant cost going towards um, the cost of, of, of the publication. Now, this has at, at its base uh, an economy of the article, so it has an association with the APC um, because, in fact, we're saying to the funders, you're responsible for 3% of the budget because of the number of articles that you've sponsored. So there is a, a, a turning point, if you like, or an, an argument around the economics of it that hinges on article costs. But what it's not working with and what uh, Martin presented very graphically with those two washroom doors um, was the idea that there is a, uh, that the weight or burden um, of the cost doesn't fall on the authors. And that, is, I hope everyone recognizes, is a showstopper in the social sciences uh, and the humanities, but I'm actually running into a lot of discontent um, around APCs and the sciences. That that system was very successful in, uh, in recouping the, the revenue that had been lost from giving up subscriptions. Um, but the inequities around it uh, and the management costs around it and the waivers and the other aspects of it 
um, uh, including the accountability from the funder transfers to the authors to their, uh, the authors not being very good consumers about it is, a, is an ongoing issue. So I, I think it's, I, I feel comfortable leaving it at that and waiting for some questions about it. Um, we're continuing to do the, uh, the analysis. We're looking at, uh, the analysis is a matter of looking at what articles have been funded, what proportion of articles have been funded in the journals. Um, we're having discussions with the, uh, in terms of the cost responsibility, so it isn't too difficult to come up with a series of cost estimates for the funders. Um, and we're hoping that we can present for each journal and then collectively for a body of journals, a proportion that the libraries would pay, the subscribing libraries, uh, and a proportion that the funders would pay, beginning with the probably the top 20% of the funders in the first round of this initiative. But Thank you. That's great, John. I, I, I think that, you know, part of the power of this approach is that you're aligning stakeholders, you're aligning the actors in the system that have a stake in scholarly publishing. So it's not just focused on libraries and library budgets, we've got funders involved and helping to align funders and institutions and then you can bring in societies who are both funders, often both funders and publishers, and you start to align all of these, the mission of these different actors um, in, in a sort of concerted action. So I think that's great. So now we have, we're passing over to Oya. Start to put in your questions um, for the um, question time. So Oya um, has been in charge of perhaps the most well-known consortial funding model, um, and that is for archive. And archive, of course, is of interest um, to many disciplines now which are looking uh, to um, have preprint servers um, in, in their fields. Oya, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, good morning and good afternoon. It's, it's a great pleasure to participate on this forum. Uh, I have great respect for, for the work of Martin and John, and as I said, I'm honored to be a part of uh, this forum. So just to build on uh, what they described, I would like to uh, provide uh, archive as a case study just to illustrate yet another way of looking at uh, consortial funding models. Um, some of you, oops, going next slide. Okay, I'm having problems going so, to the next slide. So, oh yeah, just click on the slide itself and then hit the space bar. Okay, there you go. As Katrina said, I think Archive is kind of has been a poster child, but still, let me just say a few words about it for those of you who may not know uh, Archive. Archive is a subject repository. Uh, it's, uh, it focuses on scientific uh, disciplines, and that um, it's uh, it basically a repository of preprint papers. And uh, preprints are it's a version of scholarly paper that precedes publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, Archive's mission is um, just to um, complement, actually, published, scholarly published, formal published uh, journal literature by allowing scholars to early on share their publications. Uh, this is in support of open access, but also it is to help them improve their works uh, prior to uh, these work being published uh, in uh, scholarly journals and peer-reviewed. Archive is 27 years old, and that uh, it's a pretty kind of vibrant operation. Uh, as I mentioned uh, on my first or second slide, uh, it was established in 1991 by Paul Ginsparg and came to Cornell in uh, 2001 to the library. And um, uh, what happened was, I guess, influenced by the economic uh, financial uh, turndown in around 2008, um, and especially how it manifested itself in libraries, um, we started at Cornell University Library wondering how the library alone can uh, provide uh, security and growth for this important services future. And uh, an important actress point to note is that although I will be really focusing on the business model, or I should say the financial model, I think what happened in the 2008 with Archive was that we noticed that Archive was growing, but the organization was somewhat still informal and somewhat kind of distributed. Therefore, uh, what we 
called archive sustainable initiative the core goal was to provide to uh, to develop a sustainable model a part of it was organizational and governance and of course an important part was financial and actually during this time that uh, ethica snr started publishing case studies on sustainability and that actually definitely we, uh, we, we learned and we definitely built some of the uh, lessons learned from these case studies. So let me just present to you archive business model. Uh, the budget now is about one and a half million dollars in indirect a year and that Cornell University Library contributes $170,000 plus the uh, covering indirect expenses. We were very, very fortunate to early on engage the Simons Foundation, which is a scientific foundation with a focus on physics and mathematics. And that they have actually a very interesting model, uh, which is matching fund, because for, for, uh, from their perspective, for the sustainability of the model that we are establishing, they felt that there will be others contributing, and they wanted to have their funds to be used to encourage the community. So it's a $400,000 matching grant. And the way we match this grant is through the library memberships. We um, uh, have been uh, gathering, uh, generating about more than half a million dollars from uh, member institutions. And we supplement this with uh, online fundraising and also grants. And let me kind of slow down and take you through uh, some of these points. So uh, at the heart of Archive's membership model, which is open to libraries and research organizations, is um, an annual membership fee. And that uh, the highest is $4,400. It goes all the way down to $1,000, but we really are much more interested in affordability that we welcome uh, uh, contributions, even if it's $500, which is perfectly fine from our perspective. We set the highest at uh, 4,400 because that's the uh, that's the annual subscription fee for average physics or mathematics journal. Uh, the membership is based on uh, usage that we are registering. So we basically approach the libraries and research laboratories, research institutions, institutions where we are seeing heavy usage of archive, downloads of archive, and that uh, here you can see the distribution of the membership. Uh, almost uh, uh, about 68% uh, about, uh, of membership is from countries other than the US. And uh, something I want to note is that we greatly benefit from our uh, collaboration with uh, consortia. As you would see from this chart, uh, France, Germany, United Kingdom, uh, Japan, and then there are three consortia from, uh, from the United States these organizations greatly help us by uh, gathering uh, donations, gathering funding from their member institutions and also to encouraging them to give. So I would actually conclude with um, just some insights about what's working well and what are the challenges. Uh, I have been the archive uh, program uh, director for 10 years, but uh, I involved in archive in means of uh, setting up sustainable the model earlier, so my experience would be kind of just being in this for 10 years almost. First of all, uh, I truly believe that consortial models, membership models are really important in helping spread awareness about business aspects of open access. The goal with open access is making access use free, but open access is not free. It really costs a lot of money to run services such as archives. The second value of membership models is that I think it promotes, a, it creates a culture of investing in open scholarly communication infrastructure and seeing it as public good. When I uh, started this initiative, uh, I was hearing questions and concerns about free rider, but I must tell you that I think our community has passed that stage and that they understand that it's a shared responsibility and that there is more tolerance uh, about this concept of free rider. The third, uh, I would say, positive thing about this membership model is that it really uh, inspires transparency and accountability. For instance, for archive, last uh, six, seven years, you can go to the archive uh, public wiki and you will see the organizational chart, annual reports, the budget, roadmaps, 
maps priorities. I think as we are asking the community, our different communities to contribute, we also in return should demonstrate them how responsible we are in using these funds. And the last uh, benefit on this page that I want to highlight is that I think it's an effective uh, transitional business strategy. I was just looking at some of uh, my correspondence with uh, libraries um, eight years ago as we were just establishing this model. And interestingly, I kept on referring to it as a bridge strategy, just as a strategy for archive as we are working on building an endowment. So with that smile, I want to now <coughs> Talk a little about challenges, uh, you know, what we are learning and what are the challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, there are now tens, if not hundreds, of uh, uh, open source or open access initiatives that are really relying on funds from the libraries and other uh, academic and cultural organizations. So there's quite a bit of competition. Eight years ago, when I was talking with some libraries, there were a handful, maybe uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, and Archive, but now uh, they are really trying to allocate funds for dozens of requests that they are receiving. Uh, the second one I want to highlight is the management overload, and I was very happy to hear Martin talking about uh, this being hard work. Uh, creating is the easy part. Maintaining is very hard work. It has overhead. You need to be uh, you need to be open to your community, be uh, always ready to engage with them, communicate with them, and to do risk management and risk assessment. I would say it definitely has a significant overhead. I, I think I already indicated this. Uh, I do see that I, I admire uh, consortial funding model and uh, all the different initiatives, uh, uh, initiatives uh, using it, but on the other hand, I really don't see it as a core revenue source. I think it should be seen as one of the revenue sources, and it's critical for open access uh, systems and services to build on diversified uh, revenue sources, including endowments and uh, a variety of sources to be prepared for economic, uh, economic problems, but also, but as I said, competition in this space. And the uh, last point that I want to relate to you is that, and which we really are uh, feeling this a lot with Archive right now, um, consortial models are pretty effective for services with stable, ongoing operational expenses and with some you know, reasonable growth with inflation or some modest growth. But services such as Archive, where there's a, there's a significant overhead, in maintaining a repository architecture, experimenting with new features, uh, engaging in research and development, I would argue that consortial funding models are inadequate. Uh, actually, what I have been doing, or I have been trying to do last four or five years is uh, trying to uh, create a separate track in means of writing grants and engaging uh, foundations uh, to get one-time funds for special development projects. Uh, it seems to be working, but as I said, uh, I would by, all, by no means claim what we are doing with Archive as fully satisfactory. I'm seeing it as work in progress. And that, uh, you know, I think it's uh, really important to think about what, is, uh, the, what we are going to do next year, but I'm also anxious for a community to think about what is, how is this space going to look like five or 10 years from now. And in conclusion, although uh, in this session I really focused on business model aspects of it, especially the consortial funding model, I want to highlight that really we should be thinking about uh, open access uh, models in means of this holistic sustainability aspects, not only the financial stability. It is the organizational model that we create, the information policies that we adhere to, the quality control mechanisms, and, uh, and the uh, repository architectures that we use and that are scalable and uh, useful for the community. As I said, uh, what comes with the community consortial funding models is the need for transparency and accountability. So we are trying to contribute uh, to, to this end 
by maintaining a public wiki and sharing um, many planning documents from budgets to uh, reserve policies. So I think it's a good ending point for me. I mean, I want to thank you and um, look forward to hearing your questions and comments. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. All right. And the questions are rolling in. But uh, just before we, we start uh, with those, I was wondering whether John and Martin wanted to respond to some of the challenges that Oya had raised towards the end about the consortial uh, model, just uh, briefly, if either of you would like to um, chip in. I mean, I'll, I'll just say that for my type of operation, which is obviously not at the scale of archive, and because it comes with different types of overhead, I think, um, not running entirely our own platform in-house, for instance. Um, we have found that it is a, a model that seems to be supporting our revenue needs at the moment. But I think Oya's point about uh, global financial collapse, pressures on library budgets is a really valid one. Uh, when you get competition in the space of non-classical economic models, you've got a very weird set of uh, priority decisions that have to be made by libraries. I mean, people who say to me, what's the biggest challenge for the Open Library of Humanities? And I say, Brexit and unstable worldwide politics that change economic circumstances in ways we can't control. So it's always just about that risk planning. And that's the same for subscriptions. You could be the target of a cut of subscription budgets from libraries. But when you're talking about a model where the rival or spin-off benefit to the institution is not the same as thing they're paying for access to. You are a softer target for cutting. So I think I, I partially agree with what Oya was saying there, but I think that comes from a different perspective, a different organisation, but we share those risks of library budget collapse. Okay, and, and John, very briefly, if you can. Yes, very quickly, just to say that um, we're in a state of transition in which open access seems like an extra. We are asking for additional support and funding uh, when really it's integral to the future of scholarly publishing. It's not an extra add-on. So um, in that period of transition, I think we have to struggle with that aspect. But the assumption that goes back to Martin's point is that this is a necessary service uh, and open access is the optimum way to provide that service. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just going to start um, actually from one from the top, top, which actually hits at the heart of, of issues for scholarly societies. Um, and this is from Alison Reed. The issue for scholarly societies is not just cost recovery, it's about replacing the net revenue that subsidizes other programs related to the mission. So can societies realistically take this on and what answer do you have for them? Uh, um, well, Martin especially perhaps, but, uh, but John and Oya as well. Mark, we're going first with you. I'll just I'll put in my two pennies on this, and John, you probably have more to say. Um, so there, there's several different issues that come together in this question. Um, the first is the kind of blunt question of whether library budgets were ever meant to subsidise learned society activities outside of um, publishing. Now, different people from different um, help into perspectives think differently about this. Uh, but the fact is, I think as John said, we've got to where we are, and that is how those activities are subsidised, and the cost negotiation has gone on today to get to that point. Um, it doesn't seem to me that that precludes a transition to this type of model. It just means that your cost might be higher than a publisher who uh, did not have those additional activities to subsidise. Um, now, obviously, Nobody is saying that you can guarantee that revenue will be ongoing, but nobody can say it's going to be ongoing from the subscriptions at this point. So I don't think there's anything to lose in experimenting with a transition then. But if you have enough subscribers, then actually the overheads of funding, you know, each PhD student the society offers or each fellowship goes down with each institution that's added on. You won't ever be as cheap as archive that doesn't do that, for instance, then it funds just its core activities. So you might look uncompetitive. But I guess that comes back just for me, my last point here to Hoyer's statement that it's not just publishers really that need to diversify their income streams and think about how they fund these activities. I think learned societies need to have that difficult conversation as well. Um, if this is really a value to your disciplinary communities, 
why is it libraries are the people who are funding it at the moment and what other ways could be used to redistribute funding to enable those valuable disciplinary activities to continue. No, that's a very good point. Uh, John, did you want to say something? Yes, can I take a contrary stand, of course, not of course, but to Martin, and to say that um, the societies are providing value with all of their activities, um, and those have been traditionally built into the cost of subscriptions. Um, and my model, the model I'm proposing of Library Plus Funder, it would sustain that. That's how the target revenue for the journal would be set in terms of all of its typical allocations of that revenue. Um, and that the, the, you're still offering libraries a discount and you're still giving funders, uh, you're still asking funders to come forward and pick up their responsibility. So I don't, um, I've learned over the years that the best approach is to start where, where people are. Um, and not to say this begins with some kind of loss of services um, or quality or any other aspect. In fact, I think we need to turn the open access argument or discussion to the aspect of it contributing to the quality of publishing, not simply reducing the price. Okay, um, Claire, did you have a, a question? Uh, there was a question that came in from Melanie Schlosser, the Library Publishing Coalition, which is for John. Subscribe to Open is designed to get around a substantial problem in libraries paying for OA, which is the prohibition in many institutions against voluntary contributions. How does your model handle that? Yes, uh, so the, uh, the other thing that many libraries are under constraint around is taking the cheapest possible price on things. So we are saying to the libraries that uh, this is not a voluntary contribution, and, that, and I think that's an important point. It goes back to Oya's point about um, institutions asking for OA support. We're not asking for OA support. We're asking to support the journals that this institution uses. Uh, and we will provide all of those institutions, all of those libraries, with a full accounting of how the institution is using it and paying for a service. The fact that the rest of the community is able to use the journal should be to the library's credit. And the fact that the library is paying less than it paid previously under subscription conditions should be a point of celebration. Right, thank you. Um, I've got a, a question for Oya. Um, what is the, and this is from Philip Kern, what is the free rider rate? And is there any penalty for institutions that don't join? Um, excellent question. Uh, first of all, uh, archive is uh, free to submit papers and to download papers from. So being a member organization uh, is really not a factor. Uh, there are no penalties. So it's kind of really more of a um, moral duty or more of a you know kind of academic contribution. Uh, quantifying free riders it's difficult, but let me tell you that there are thousands and thousands of institutions using archive and what we did was we literally looked at usage coming from these organizations there was a very very long tail and that we focused on past its uptick and there were around 300 libraries and we decided to focus on those 300 libraries where maybe 70 percent of the users is coming from and among those libraries i would say let's say 350 libraries 227 of them are members, so it gives you a sense of uh, who is not funding. Unfortunately, we were not able to engage China, although we know that it's uh, number three in means of uh, usage coming from, uh, you know, if you look at in international distribution. Okay, thank you. There was a question for Martin. Uh, what is the general rate, sorry, this is from Matthew Charlton, what is the general range that institutional members contribute to participate in Open Library of Humanities? It varies. Um, our lowest rate is around $600, um, and the highest rate is around $2,300. It depends entirely upon institution size, but you know, if the institution came to us and said, at the end of the year, I'm afraid we've only got $300 left, but we're really looking to spend it on something worthwhile, it would help us, so we wouldn't say no. And it really is, you know, that kind of flexibility and acknowledging that there are different types of constraint on different institutions that works well for us. But just to follow up on what Oya was saying about free rider rates, um, my um, some of my staff members say to me, uh, they always have a shaming campaign for people <laughs> who publish loads of articles. And there are some institutions who have published loads of articles with us and cost us loads of money. 
uh, who don't subscribe, who are the bad free riders in a sense. But on the other hand, you, you can't take that kind of approach with a base who are mm. contributing on that moral basis that, that Oya said. Um, so it's quite a difficult one because internally I'm really frustrated, but externally I'm thinking, no, that that is their choice in a way. And if they don't support us, we can't continue to exist. That's the gamble they want to take. Um, we'll see how it plays out. Um, I should note also that the ATC model isn't devoid of free riders. Uh, whenever publishers have a uh, publication fee assistance program or, or um, a, a waiver program, um, there is that possibility that, that, that some authors will, will claim not to be able to pay or, or whatever when, when they can. Um, I have a, a question for John from um, Alicia Wise um, of Information Power here. Hi, John. Would the publishers invoice funders and libraries directly? Or would they continue to invoice libraries, consortia, to whom the funders uh, would make their financial contributions? So if the latter, the library consortial ability to negotiate uh, for efficiencies gains would be strengthened or might be strengthened. Slightly garbled, that one. Um, uh, yes. No, um, so uh, what we want to do, part of the, this whole thing is to take advantage of existing technologies. Um, so we have almost all articles going through Crossref, which is collecting this data. Um, and I think we could create a much more efficient system of automated invoicing on an annual basis to each of the organizations involved, that is each of the funders and each of the libraries. Um, so uh, this is partly a technical taking advantage of a technology that would reduce uh, the transaction costs, that is the number of times that money is shifted from one institution to another through indirect costs or through APC allocations and budgets. So, uh, and the Cronus situation, the Cronus that Gates is set up, which specifically for Gates, um, has now been made, has now been spun off in a truly Gates fashion, um, and is an independent entity that uh, any funder can license to use. Uh, I'm not recommending that that's the best model at this point, um, but it is to say that there is an efficient system uh, for automating the billing uh, and that would put funders in a position of being directly responsible in the way that I'm advocating. Um, but I think actually within the existing technology, a combination of ORCID perhaps and Crossref, we could easily implement uh, this kind of invoicing. Uh, just a follow-up question for that. Um, could you make this simpler, as Martin has, and bill through uh, Lyratus in the USA? Yes, it, it, yes, that's a, a very good organization and it has played that kind of role as working it with annual reviews. Um, these are decisions that need to be made collectively by the publishers and the libraries and the funders. Um, so we haven't, so I don't want to presume too much around that kind of detail. Is it Cronus? Is it a third party? Is it integral to the whole Crossref system that we're currently using? What I do want to suggest, though, is that we are underutilizing existing technologies that could create a much more efficient and a much more accountable system. Um, and for the, I mean, one of the challenges for funders is they is tracking what's been published uh, with their accounts, and and many funders have to put penalties uh, on the researchers who because they will not fess up that they published an article out of their grant. I mean, it seems to me. Incredible, incredible situation, but at any rate, it's true. Um, so the idea that we would improve the accountability in this process, that, so we're, it's a, a matter of rationalization that will reduce costs, not hugely, but, but significantly, um, and at the same time, uh, allow um, a sense of responsibility rather than a sense of charity or um, that whole thing that I referred to is just, are you just another group asking for open access handouts? We need to move away from that proposition. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, actually on that, OASPA has a proposal up on its blog post for an OA switchboard, which you might have seen um, and written yes. by the president of OASPA. Um, it's the idea is out there, but if anyone is interested in pursuing that, you should certainly contact uh, yeah. And Yeah, so I'm planning to meet with Paul Peters to discuss the connections between the two. Great. Um, so it, yes, the the switchboard introduces a, a level of accountability as well in terms of the tracking of information. Um, I want to go a step further, but uh, I think there's room for that. My proposal, by the way, is up on the OASPA site. Yes, it is. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'm assuming everyone has read it first. Um, now I'm just aware that we're hitting the hour, um, so I, I understand that people will have to leave. 
but we will um, carry on the questions for another um, 10 minutes or so um, for those who would like to stay. Okay, Claire, have you got one? This is a question for everybody, which is, what would you say are the biggest success factors in acquiring consortium members? Are you using existing networks and associations as multipliers? Who'd like to go first? Hey, maybe I'll go first. Uh, I think from Archive's perspective, the biggest success factor is that Archive is serving the needs of the scientific community. So the libraries are getting their directions and motivations from their scientists. They know that their scientists rely on Archive. They know that Archive is trying to do a good job. So I would say the biggest success factor is Archive working for scientists. That's why libraries are contributing to Archive. Not that Archive is open access, because their scholars are using Archive. And the second I would say success factor is over the years, we try to develop a governance model and include uh, library groups in decision making. And uh, I think that has been, uh, I believe, an influential factor too. I think the uh, number one biggest factor as to whether an institution supported us was whether I flew to their campus and gave them a talk in person about it. <laughs> um, during our initial grant funded period, I was giving two to three talks per week um, around the world. It was not terribly ecologically sound. Um, it was definitely not sound for my health. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into the fact that I had a stroke. That was actually coincidental to uh, this, but essentially, there is no substitute for explaining this model on the ground. But the thing is, I think that this model is now more widely known than when we started, and people do understand how it works much better. So the overheads are now lower, but the competition is more fierce. So yeah, no, I, do, I do want to stress again, actually, the thing that I said, two things that I said, which was transparency is absolutely crucial to this. But the, the overheads of transparency are also massive. Yeah. The overheads of providing this kind of information. I mean, we get a request probably at least two per week from institutions who want detailed breakdown of figures that we do not easily have to hand and that will take hours of staff time to compile. You know, John's right, there are there are more efficient ways you could do this, but we work sponsoring a range of publishers like Liverpool University Press. Um, we work with Ubiquity Press, we have some of our own platform. Aggregating all this information on a per institutional basis has huge amounts of labor involved. Getting new institutions to join your model also has huge amounts of labor involved. And people who say that you can just set it up and people will flock to you and your members will come in do not know what they're talking about. That's I not the way right. <laughs> John. I, want, yes. I want to emphasize okay. the last point, Mark. I just want to emphasize the last point Martin made. It's not auto, it's not on autopilot, it's work. <laughs> yeah. uh, as someone who hasn't launched this model yet, I, uh, I, I feel like I'm a little naive, but I would say <laughs> the success of this is uh, 20 years of uh, listening, um, and re sometimes reluctantly and sometimes a little stubbornly. Um, but trying to become increasingly sensitive to the interests of all of the stakeholders in this and to, um, to learn to respect uh, and to learn to think about the incentives and the uh, structure and the common cause. So those two sides, the incentives on the one side of each of the stakeholders and the common cause across them. Um, and so this is our current, my current and the librarians, uh, a group I work with, our current um, sense of how we uh, have a system that addresses those aspects while increasing the accountability, as Martin raises, um, and takes advantage of current technologies and perhaps most importantly, uh, a sense that, that we have reached a tipping point, again, Martin's point, uh, a tipping point um, with regard to open access on a universal basis, not simply as a charity and not simply as this would be good for this field. Right, thank you. Um, uh, it's interesting actually coming back to that point that it's hard work. I mean, the, the major publishers usually have a very large marketing wing. Um, so um, uh, they're doing that. And, and I, I, um, you know, uh, Open Library of Humanities and Archive don't have that, that same resources. It's worth saying as well that people seem to think that you don't need marketing in an open access world. And it may be true that there's less effort needed to promote, say, an article 
to get it to the front page of a newspaper if a journalist can actually access it. But if you're talking about revenue models, most of the work that we do is is marketing. It's about sending someone out to try and tell people what we do and why it's worth supporting. Yeah, and that's the hard work that we're lacking. <laughs> it's hugely important. Um, there's a there's a very uh, interesting question here um, from Lynn Miller. Have any of the speakers of you on applying this model to monographs? We've only talked about journals, really. Well, I mean, Knowledge Unlatched has applied this model to monographs yeah. extensively, is what I'd say there. Um, I, I am a big fan of not-for-profit initiatives, and Knowledge Unlatched is now a for-profit initiative, but even acknowledging that side of it, they have done more for open access monographs than almost any other mm -hmm. initiative on the planet, and they did it through a consortial funding model. Um, again, if you look at how their staff breakdown works out, though, a lot of it is marketing, a lot of it is sales. They've developed their own infrastructure for funding. Um, again, it's not, as far as I know, an open source thing. So it's another one of those Kronos type platforms that's specific to one initiative. And I think what John was hinting at was, wouldn't it be great if there was a, a system that anyone could use um, to, yeah. um, in the spirit of developing brilliant open source platforms? Um, so yes. I've thought about it extensively, but I think large analysts are doing a good job in that space and continue to do a good job in that space, even if you might contest their selection procedures um, and the challenges they're trying to negotiate around that. It, it, because the costs are so much higher for a monograph, the consortial model looks quite obvious in that system. You know, very few humanists who want to publish a book can get their hands on the $16,000 on book processing charge that some publishers are demanding. But if you can get um, 1,600 libraries to pay $100 each, suddenly that's looking a lot more appealing. Okay. Yeah. Claire, do you want to? I think I've got one, I've not. Have you? Okay. So there's uh, here from Robin Sin. Robin Sin, um, will Gates's intent to align with Plan S, banning embargoes, um, disrupt any of their current publishing publisher partnerships within Cronos, do you think? It's a slightly slightly peripheral question. Uh, but someone who's basing their work on the Gates Initiative, um, I'd say no. I'd say the, the Plan S, I mean, if anything, the critique of the Plan S is partly that it is uh, a smattering of ideas and not a consistent, coherent program. Um, it's setting some important parameters, certainly. Um, and it's taking a fairly open-ended approach to what are the good ideas that it can get behind. So, um, what I think that is important about Plan S, though, is to say that it is a consortial model of funding uh, among funders. Um, and that kind of collaboration uh, and the way in which, um, without a systematic campaign, Plan S has attracted uh, additional membership um, in a, a very encouraging sense. And that's partly the inspiration for the, the funder, sorry, the library plus funder model that I'm, I'm advocating. Okay. Okay, we've got two last questions. Um, one for Oya. How, um, uh, how is uh, Archive's consortial membership uh, model, how has it influenced your governance system? Um, it's influenced our governance system in the way that um, initially we only had a, a scientific advisory board. So the advisory board was mainly focusing on um, scientific policies that pertain to archive day-to-day -day operation means of preference being submitted and reviewed and posted. And as we entered the uh, consortial membership model, uh, one, of the, um, one of the leverage points we had was uh, our promise to include the library community more closely in the future, in determining the future of archive. Therefore, we established a member advisory board, which is um, selected, elected an election process and nominations from member libraries and then an election process. I think that definitely uh, shaped, partially shaped the governance model and how we work with these two advisory boards. Great, thank you. And for Martin, just to finish off with societies, which is sort of where you started, how could, um, a learned society actually use this model to transition to OA? How could or could? Could, could. 
มาอ่านถามโอ้คือโอ้คือดงเออ <laughs> yeah, I mean, so could have learned it. Could have learned it. Sorry. This but, could be a question for John as well as me here, but essentially, yes. So, learned societies or any type of publisher has an existing base of subscribers who are at the moment paying for access, and if they're libraries, the majority of them have been asking for open access for two decades as well. So, I think you have a willing constituency. Asking them whether they will continue to pay a subscription uh, while the journal is made open access, and pulling them in advance, as the annual review model does, on whether you get, say, 95% of them saying yes, enables you to benchmark whether or not you've got goodwill among libraries. There, there are challenges because often publishers have uh, third-party subscription intermediaries, for instance. So often, those societies don't know. Who their subscribers actually are, but any good intermediary that is working on your behalf would be willing, I think, just to trial this model if the journal and the loan society pushed hard enough. So um, I have a blog post that's attracted quite a bit of attention about how you'd implement this on the ground, what kind of percentages look like. There are some details still to be worked out, but this is a viable transition strategy. But still, take into account everything I just said about. Risk distribution, revenue, thinking about diversifying revenue streams at the same time. But if anyone wants to drop me an email to discuss this in more detail, I'm very happy. And, and John's obviously got his big event later this month to discuss this and a plan for it. So um, I think this is an exciting time for Learned Society and other publishers. Okay, John gets the last word. Well, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. I, I just want to say that the uh, American Anthropological Association is coming to this meeting on, on the 24th um, of the month, um, and they're very interested with a group of 30 journals. Um, they are feeling pressure from their membership and from their leadership to move into open access. They have concerns about funding a range of activities beyond simply the publication itself um, that they still think are integral to the quality of the publishing. Uh, and we're coming to them with a proposal to look at involving the funders in a way they haven't before while continuing to get the support of the libraries by offering them a more attractive situation, both open access and a reduced cost. Fantastic. Um, and with that, uh, we've, we've managed to retain 100 participants um, uh, right to the end. Some had to drop off, about 50 or so had to drop off. Thank you so much, um, all of you, for participating and contributing. I know that um, uh, your Twitter handles are on the Ask the website. Uh, make sure the audience follow them, ask them questions. Thank you also to OASPA and Claire for organizing these, and not least to Copyright Clearance Center. And look out for the next one. It's going to be interesting again. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.